this lecture we are going to learn how to download and install IBM SPSS software. IBM SPSS software is available for free trial from IBM website for 14 days so you can download the software from there and practice on it. To download and install the software go to the Google and type IBM SPSS statistics download press enter and the first link will take you to the download page of IBM which will give you access to the free trial version so this page lists many other softwares which are available for download and if you want to download the SPSS just click on it and it will take you to the download page so for downloading IBM SPSS uh, software you need to first do a registration with your IBM ID and if you don't want to do the registration with your IBM ID just to save your time you can sign up with your LinkedIn so you can select your country and reason and write your name then your email address write your phone number select your province company so we are not listing any company here and you can choose whether you are a student or not so if you want to receive the promotional information you can click over it and you can also select your preference for contact then you have to agree to their terms and conditions and click on I confirm as you can see on this page the trial version is available for 14 days so depending upon your operating system whether you are working with Windows Linux or Mac OS you can download it at the same time you should keep in mind these uh, three versions are available for the 64 bit operating system if you are having 32 bit operating system then you should click on 32 bit software this one but uh, how you, you would know that your operating system is 64 bit or 32 bit it's a simple to know your operating system go to your control panel and type system so once you click on this system information you can see your uh, in my case the operating system is 64 bit operating system x64 based processor so in case your operating system is 32 bit operating system so you will get the 32 bit operating system information here so depending upon your operating system make the right choice so I'm going to download the 64 bits Windows version so click on it so let me create a new folder here and save the file so it's a big file depending upon the speed of your internet it will take some time so I am stopping the recording at this stage and will be back once download is finished and we will learn how to install the SPSS software we have finished downloading the SPSS software now let's learn how to install it to install the software locate it in your computer I have downloaded the software here so just right click over it to install and run as an administrator so IBM installer is now extracting the file for uh, installation purpose and you can see it's uh, reading like IBM SPSS statistics 24 so we are installing the SPSS 24 version you can see the setup is preparing to install the files so now the wizard is ready to install the files so it will be ask you to proceed ahead so click on next then you have to accept the license agreement if you want you can read the license agreement by going through here and 
these are the details of various programs that are going to be installed so click on next IBM SPS statistics essential for Python now IBM has allowed us uh, Python and R functionality integration in SPSS so I should recommend that you click on S because you would like to work with Python and R in future so click next then again accept the license agreement and you have been asked to accept the license second time because this time you are also installing the python 2.7.6 and 2.3.4.3 license so agree and click next and this is the installation folder where the files are being installed it's uh, good to know where the spss files are being installed so that later on whenever we will take the example files to demonstrate uh, various tests it's uh, very handy to find out where they are located so it's being stored in your uh, c drive in program files folder remember if it's a 32 bit uh, operating system then your files will be installed in program files x86 folder because if you go to your c drive there are two folders program files and program files x86 so all the 64 bit softwares are installed in the program files folder while all the 32 bit softwares are installed in the x86 folder so our SPSS 24 version is being installed here so take note of this if you want to change it you can change and install it somewhere else some people recommend uh, installing the software in say external hard drives and uh, this is uh, like say if sometime if you uninstall or like say refresh your window your software doesn't get erased but I will recommend install always your software in C drive they run faster there and they are managed better there so click on next and click on install so the installation has started it may take few moments to finish the installation We are waiting for the installation to finish. So the installation has finished. Now it's asking us to start the SPSS. So let's click on finish and start the software. So the software is starting and we can see it's version 24 and uh, it's asking us to register the product for trial so if you want to register with your email id you can give your email id if you have already purchased the software then you can license your product and uh, if you want to purchase the product then you can click on the buy now option and purchase so currently we are uh, looking to try the software so enter your email id and click on start trial so you can see it's giving us access for the 14 days and the screen says your 14 days left in your trial so again if you want to purchase at any moment you can click on the buy now option and, push and, and purchase the product and to license the product you can click on this license button and license the product so this dialog box is handy but every time when you start a software it's a little bit annoying so what you can do if you don't want to use this screen or don't want to see this screen again in future so just click on this check box don't show the dialog box in future but if you want to like see the dialog box in future you can leave it unchecked so anyway let it be and let's close it and this is the interface of the new SPSS 24 version so we can see all those options that we need to learn is located here so in the coming lectures we are going to focus on how to master these options
In this lecture, we are going to learn fundamentals of statistics. What statistics is? Statistics is a branch of mathematics that is used for organization and interpretation of the numerical data. Organization of numerical data and basically interpretation of numerical data. Now when it comes to the organization of data, the kind of statistic that which we use is known as the descriptive statistics. So descriptive statistics is basically used to describe the situation or the event or whatever the property that you are measuring. For example, suppose you are discussing the marks obtained by students in the examination, you might be interested in what is the average mark scored by the students or what is the spread or deviation of the marks. So mean, median, mode, standard deviations, percentiles, quartiles, they are all example of the descriptive statistics and we will learn about them in the coming lectures. We will also use SPSS to calculate the descriptive statistics. But most often as a researcher we work with the interpretation of numerical data and we try to draw certain inferences based on the available data. So apart from interpretation I should use a word here called inference. So the prime use of or the practical use of statistics is to draw inferences from the numerical data. Now when it comes to drawing inferences we have to go by two approaches and that depends upon the nature of our data. So we can have two type of approaches here depending upon the shape of distribution and certain assumptions whether our data fulfills them or not and we call these two approaches as the parametric statistics and, and there is non-parametric statistics. Parametric statistics as its name suggests refers to the kind of stats that is used when certain assumptions about the population parameters like say its mean, standard deviation are fulfilled like the normality of distribution, homogeneity of variance, randomness of selection and independence of samples. So if these assumptions are fulfilled, we use a kind of stat that is known as the parametric stat, your t-test, z-score, one-way ANOVA, regression, linear regression, they are all example of the parametric stats. But when these assumptions are violated, we use a kind of stat that is known as the non-parametric stats. For example, say man whitney u test you might have heard of or most popular chi-square test. So these are the tests we use when our data fail to meet one of the four assumptions uh, recommended for the parametricity. Let's try to learn what are parametric and non-parametric tests. Now if you use SPSS, most of the times you are going to face this problem whether to use a parametric test or non-parametric test. That's a vital choice for a researcher. So what they are? The first person to talk about parametric and non-parametric tests was somebody called Jacob Wolfowitz. Jacob Wolfowitz in 1942 try to draw a distinction between those tests which make assumption about the nature of a variable in their population. Now why this assumption is important? If you already know about the population and you develop a test on the basis of those assumptions or apply a test, then in that case your results will be more generalizable, isn't it? For example, suppose you are studying the age variable and you want to find out some conclusion about the age and you already are aware like how the age is distributed in the population, entire population, say Indian population or say American population. And whatever test you are going to use in that case is going to give you a more generalizable result. While in other case when you are not aware about the features of like say variable that you are studying, especially in the population, then you are not going to create a situation where the results would be generalizable. So that was the beauty of parametric tests and that's why your researcher, supervisor or general editor often nudges you if not ask you to use parametric tests more often as compared to non-parametric tests because these are the tests whose results are more generalizable as compared to non-parametric tests because in that case we are sure about the distribution or like the nature of variables in its population. 
So if you understand this, then we can draw certain distinctions between parametric and non-parametric tests. So what are the distinctions? Now whatever I'm going to mention here is not an exhaustive list of like say, distinctions between parametric and non-parametric tests, but these are the most common distinctions that one should keep in mind while choosing a suitable test. So first important assumption of parametric tests like your t-test and or like say, z test is the normality of distribution. So you understand that a normal distribution is a bell-shaped distribution. So the variable that you are studying, if it is normally distributed in its population, then we say that the variable is a normally distributed variable or the variable has been drawn from a population which has the normal distribution of that variable. For example, if you are studying the is variable in India, it means the is variable is normally distributed in the entire Indian population. But the point is that we are not studying the population, we are just studying the sample, then what's the point of believing in this, okay, the is variable is normally distributed in the population. It doesn't make any sense because all in all you are studying a small sample. The idea is that if you take a sufficiently large sample, in that case, the distribution of is in your sample will approximate to a normal distribution. And that's why your supervisor or like say journal editor, though journal editors never ask you to do this, people generally recommend you to take large samples. Why they recommend you to take large samples? Because if you take large sample, it means in that case you are going to create a normal distribution for the variable that you are studying. So that's why it's important to take a large sample. In fact, that is known as the central limit theorem. If you keep on drawing the large sample from the population, you are going to create a normal distribution. While in case of non-parametric test, it's not guaranteed. You might not be aware of the distribution of the variable. It might be highly skewed, positively skewed or negatively skewed. So we can say in this case, we are having a non-normal distribution. Then second important assumption of parametric test is homogeneity of variance. It means what? When you are taking like say different different groups for comparison. So in that case whatever the variance of score in one group should be equal to variance of score in other group up to say n number of groups. For example you are taking uh, comparison between three different types of therapies, for example, the psychodynamic therapies, behavioral therapy, or cognitive therapy. So in that case, the distribution or the variance of the scores for each of these three subsamples, psychodynamic, behavioral, and cognitive, must be approximately same. So that is the homogeneity of variance condition while this condition might be violated in case of a non-parametric test. So we can see variance of one sample might not be equal to variance of other sample, which might not be equal to variance of say nth sample. So normality of distribution, homogeneity of variance, and third is independence of observations. So independence is third important criteria. It means whatever persons you have taken to study in group one in no way affect the score of persons in study group, study two. So we have taken suppose three groups, like say one is for cognitive therapy, and there is for like say behavioral therapy, and there is for like say psychodynamic therapy and if you measure the stress of person who has been treated by like say this therapy then it, it doesn't affect the stress of person who has been treated by say some other therapy in like say behavior group XB for the behavior group and XP for the psychodynamic group these groups these scores are independent of each other so they are not influencing their score in any way. The fourth important condition is randomness. So randomness means all the subjects who are part of your study 
should be randomly selected it means you have randomly drawn your sample so it means you are going for a probability sampling method you must be remembering your sampling class which says that there are two types of sampling method one is probability sampling method and then there is the non probability sampling method and random sampling method is a type of probability sampling method in which we draw subjects by using some random criteria for example we can take every third or like say every fifth subject or we can take a random number generator or by using just a fist ball sampling method we can randomly select subjects by using some chit or random algorithm so random sampling is the fourth important criteria then one more like say corollary of all these could be your data should be measured on the interval scale now you must be knowing all in all there are four types of scales that we use in social science measurement and they are the nominal scale ordinal scale interval scale and ratio scale nominal scales are perfectly categorical measurement like say male and female while ordinal scales are the scales in which the categories can be rank ordered like say height of the students in a class that can be arranged in a short height medium height or tall height while interval scale data is the kind of data in which the quantity of measurement between two intervals of a scale remains constant throughout the scale the typical example is the likert type of scale so if you are using a likert kind of arrangement it means you are having a interval measure and you can go for a parametric test let me tell you just for the sake of information that interval scale is the most commonly used type of measurement scale in the social science research especially and if you are using like say ratio scale which has like say interval property as well as the absolute zero that's wonderful so these are the four uh, criteria four five criteria which generally your data should fulfill in that case you can go for a parametric test first normality of distribution so the variable should show a normal shape and the idea is that they are normally distributed in the population and if you have taken a sufficiently large sample then it's going to reflect in the sample as well second homogeneity of variance so different groups that you are using must have the same variances third is the independence of observation so observation of one candidate or subject in no way affect the observation from another candidate or subject and then we have the randomness as the fourth criteria so the samples must be randomly drawn from the population while the measurements have been taken on the interval scale at least are defined what are the scales that has been used to measure them and it's very important that before you start entering your data you have a good conceptualization of your research variable you must be knowing that in any research we have like a set of variables and we call them independent variables and dependent variables but apart from them we should also have like what are the variables which are playing the role of like say mediating variables or whether a variable is playing role of a moderating variable or variable is just acting like a control or constant variable so the important thing is to conceptualize about your variables so variables can be your independent variable and dependent variable i will discuss more about the mediating and moderating variable in the coming lectures and it's just beginning so let's keep the example simple suppose we are taking any study in which we want to see the effect of one variable over another or the relationship between two variables for example often i teach uh, when i teach students i feel what exactly leads to good performance among the students uh, as a uh, precursor or like say as a naive idea we can believe that yes it's a hard work that leads to performance but we know that relationship is not at that simple there might be many other variables involved all in all suppose we have decided to explore this issue and we want to just find out what are the variables that influence the performance of a student now in this study performance is acting like a dependent variable why because it is the performance that we want to predict or that we want to estimate based on other variables for example say hard work so that's one relationship we have become sure of apart from hard work you might also believe that no it's a age of subject that may also act as a influencer in this variable 
or socioeconomic status of the subject might also play a role in the performance of the student. For example, those students who are from the higher socioeconomic status, they can have access to better resources that can help them in performing better. So define all your variables first in your research model and then try to enter your data in the spaces. So let's take certain variables, for example, uh, hard work, age, socioeconomic status. Now, if you look at these variables, you'll find that there is a bit of ambiguity in the way they have been expressed. For example, hard work, what do you mean by them? How you are going to measure the hard work? If we have to be more precise, then we have to mention we are going to measure hard work in terms of number of hours of study, isn't it? Age might also affect the performance, but we are not expecting age to directly affect the performance. They might act like as a moderator of performance, but not a direct precursor of performance. So what we want, we want a model in which age and socioeconomic status act like moderators. So moderators are basically those variables which moderate the relationship between independent variables and dependent variables. Means if they are present, they are significantly going to affect the relationship between these two variables. Fine. So apart from moderators, there might be mediators as well involved in the model, but we are not going to take mediators now. And Let's take one more important independent variable right now that can affect the performance and let's call it intelligence, isn't it? So intelligence might also affect the performance. So we are expecting a direct influence of intelligent or intelligence on performance. Now intelligence is again a vague word, how you are going to measure it. So we can have intelligence measured as IQ scores of the subject. So this is how you define your research model. Now this uh, research model is pretty uh, clear cut in which we are going to study the performance of college going students based on number of hours studied by them and their IQ score and at the same time we are also seeing the effect of age and socioeconomic status as a moderating variable. Let's take one more example. For example, we want to find out what exactly leads to stress. Stress can be caused by, like say, problems. Uh, we can call it daily hassles. Apart from that, we can also conceptualize it might be caused due to uh, pathological behavior or like say, uh, behaviors like say, smoking. Now if you look at the theories of stress, you will find that um, almost all the theories uh, believe that daily hassles do cause the stress. But the interesting thing would be to see the impact of smoking on stress. So in this case, uh, smoking happens to be our independent variable, while stress happens to be our dependent variable. And we want to control the effect of this variable called daily hassle because we already know daily hassles lead to stress. So we uh, want to understand at this moment if daily hassles are same for everyone, then what is the influence of smoking on stress? So in this case, we can consider it as a control variable. Fine. So that is uh, another research model, and to validate it, we can use a logist, uh, sorry, hierarchical regression analysis, and we will see it later. And uh, once you have conceptualized your model, we can start defining our variables. Can you guess, like in uh, first research model, what would be our control variable? For example, say classroom conditions, temperature, or like say noise. So we can consider all these factors as a constant variable. So if the variables are defined, now let's start entering them into SPSS. So this is our SPSS processor and we are going to enter our variables one by one. 
So first variable we wanted to record is our independent variable that is hardware. To type the name of variable you can simply press uh, click on name and start typing it and press enter. So once you enter it you can see rest of the fields have been automatically populated like say type with decimals in everything. So once you s type the name of variable automatically SPSR defines it as a numeric variable. Numeric stands for number. So SPSS is uh, basically a quantitative data analysis package. So that's why by default it defines any variable as a numeric variable but you can change it to other variable types if you wish so. But we know that hard work is going to be measured in terms of number of hours. So that is going to be a numeric variable. So let it be a numeric variable. You can also define its uh, width and decimal places. So width means basically the number of digits that you are going to have. So for example we believe that the maximum number of hours a student can study is 24. So that's maximum theoretical possible uh, number of hours. So all in all we need two digits here for width and that will be suffice for us. And yes number of hours can be in decimals so we can record it in hours, minutes and seconds and all. So let it be as two. So your width is, now since decimal places uh, are generally less than the number of width, so you can keep it little less. That you can generally take a large width, so it's not going to cause any harm. So our variables, name, type, width and decimal has been defined. Now there are certain conventions of defining variable names in SPSS and a uh, few of these conventions I will name here and you will gradually learn them through, uh, when you will enter data in SPSS through practice. For example, you cannot have a space between the variable names. If you enter a space between variable name, then you are going to get error warning. Suppose I enter a space here between hard and work, so I am going to get error warning. So variable name contains an illegal character. So you need to remove this space. It's removed already. Again, you cannot begin a variable name by a number or a special character. For example, if I write it as one hard work, suppose we are having two measures of hard work and I want to write as one hard work, two hard work, but it will not allow me to write in that way. Again, it's illegal. So if I want, I can write it as a hard work one. So that will be allowed. And if I want to have space between the names, I can use a underscore, but not the space. Again we cannot, so let's make it again hard work. It cannot have a dollar in the beginning. So if you write dollar, again you will get error warning. So it's a invalid variable name. You can have dollar in between but not in the beginning. For example, I can have a dollar symbol here. It's allowed but not in the beginning. So most of these restrictions allow, apply for the at the beginning of the variable names. Similarly, you cannot have a slash in the variable name. For example, if I put a slash here anywhere in between, it's going to give me error warning. So it's not allowed. Slash is not allowed. Similarly, comma anywhere is not allowed. So you write comma and press enter. Again, you get a error warning. So these are certain conventions while defining the variable name in SPSS. My suggestion is that when you define your variables names in SPSS, keep the variable name short for you and if you want to write descriptor for the variable name, you can use the label option. So that can be understood. For example, for hard work we can write it number of hours study. So you can write a full story here, no issue. So that will be acting like a descriptor. And let's quickly enter our other variables. So another variable is intelligence. Then we can have the performance. And performance basically means is marks obtained in the examination. intelligence we are measuring it as a IQ score and apart from that we are recording certain demographic variables like say age of subject, gender of subject, 
socioeconomic status so that we are going to record again as a numeric variable and you can see all our variables have been created here now the importance of writing the labels is that we have written labels only for the first three variables research variables not for the demographic variables and if you put a mouse cursor here you will see the description of those variables whatever you wrote in the labels so that helps you in understanding your variable when you are having a large data set you can quickly place your cursor and understand what kind of variable it is so that's how you define your variable in spaces In this lecture we are going to study about the variable types comma and dot. Now comma and dot are the two variable types which are a type of delimiters used in SPSS. They are less often used and generally because we don't uh, understand them or we don't want to specify our variables properly but it's good to know about them. So what exactly are the delimiters? So delimiters are basically the notations or the symbols which are used to demarcate the boundaries between digits. For example, say if I write 10,000, how do I write it? I can simply write it at 10,000, but at best, what we, we can do to make it more readable or better, I can put a comma here. So if I'm putting a comma here, then comma is acting like a delimiter. And generally, when we put a comma as a delimiter, then for decimal values, we use a dot here. So this is a dot value and this is the comma value. So this is the one standard kind of notation we generally follow mostly in India or United States. But in many other countries this convention is not followed in fact it's a reversed. So what happens if we have to write say 1000 now this works for if you are writing 1000 rupees. But suppose we are like say in Europe and somebody is writing 10,000 euro then he or she will write it like 10 dot now dot will act as a delimiter here and then a comma and then zeros so you can see now how the delimiters work in the different countries and it's very important to decide, define them properly else we might make a mistake so come back to SPSS and let's try to define comma and dot variable types now as you can see we have an income variable here and suppose I want to define income once as a uh, comma separated delimiter and in another case as a dot separated delimiter. Or let's have two different type of variables for example say income we are defining it as a comma separated delimiter and we can have population that we can define as a dot separated delimiter. So first to define it as a comma separated delimiter comma type variable click on comma and press OK. So once you click on it you see nothing here because our values are very small but suppose I am writing uh, something here uh, as 15 lakhs. So let me write 15 lakhs. So I am writing 5 zeros 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I am expecting comma as a delimiter once I press enter. So you can see we got uh, two commas here and that helps us in reading the things. But if you want to have decimals as well, since we have not defined decimals here in the income variable, let's define decimal up to two places. So we are having now dot as a uh, symbol that separates our values with the values after decimals. As contrary to this, if we define another variable and if we call it like say population, in that case, uh, let's define it as a dot separated delimiter and uh, let's enter the population of first uh, city or like say the city to which he belongs, though we have not recorded city, if you want we can quickly define the city variable as well. So right click and insert variable, let's call it city. So 
द पॉपुलेशन ऑफ सिटीज एंड सपोज ही बिलोंग्स टू डेली सो लेट्स मेक इट ए स्ट्रिंग वेरिएबल एंड राइट डेली एयर एंड द पॉपुलेशन इज सपोज वी आर राइटिंग समथिंग रैंडम वैल्यू फाइन एंड प्रेस एंटर सिंस वी हैव टेकन द डॉट एज ए डी लिमिटेड सो वी एक्सपेक्टिंग द डिजिट्स टू बी सेपरेटेड और Uh, means boundary to be created by using the dot variable so press okay now you can see these boundaries has been created by using the dot variable and comma separate the decimal value now in india we are not accustomed to such kind of values because we generally use the comma as a delimiter so if you want to change it you can go here and uh, we can take population and we can use as a comma delimiter so now you can see this is defined as a comma delimited value so that's we how you use the comma and dot variable types in spss after numeric comma and dot variable type options let's learn scientific notation variable type now scientific notation variable types are the variable types which are used generally by the physical scientist that is physicist or person working in the area of chemistry or biology you must have seen measuring uh, property in terms of 10 to raised to power minus 6 or minus 8 or like say power 6 or power 8 something so that kind of notation can also be written in the spss for example instead of writing 101000 you can write 10 raised to the power 3 so let us see how we can do that now i have my actual uh, example that we were using uh, effect of hard work on performance i have recorded the income of subject as 10 raised to power 6 so it means you are having six zeros after one so if this income is in thousands we can say it's a 1 million so you can see uh, 1 million can be written as 1.00 e plus 006 now let's create another new variable and to understand the negative value and i am creating here with the new variable because here the width is a very small dimension it can be measured in like say microns so suppose i am taking first example as 0.001 mm or unit so if you convert it into decimals so let's increase the number of decimals let's make it up to 4 so this is the width of here and we wanted to write 0.001 so that's basically 1 by 1000 unit now instead of keeping it as a numeric variable let's convert it into scientific notation and see what happens now we need to change the number of decimals accordingly and now you see the new width of here is 1.00 e power minus 003 so that's exactly means 0.001 or 1 by 1000 so that's how we use scientific notation in spss let's try to understand date variable type date variable type can be used when you want to enter your data in the format of some time stamp or time series or suppose simply you want to record the birth date of subjects for example in our hard work and performance study suppose i want to record the birth date of the subject and want to see its impact on the variables of entry so i can go for defining a new variable and that should be the date variable by default it's a numeric variable let's convert it into a date variable now once you click on the date you see a lot of options on the right hand side and the first you can notice it gives you a date format that is dd dash mm m dash yy yy so it's basically prompting you to define your date in the format of like say 12th of june j u n 1970 so first two digits of your day and first three letters of the month and four digits for the year so there's a typical format generally we use but if you want to use any other format you can select accordingly so once we select and let's try to define a date variable 
or entry for date variable. So let's define as 10. I'm putting a dash because dash was there in the format and if you don't put a dash you may get an error warning so you can correct accordingly and you can see our first date entry has been done it's a 10 dash December dash 1995. Let's enter our second entry in 16 October 1993. So we have the two entries now and let's try to change the date format into something else and we can see all the changes will be reflected in our data and you can see all the changes has been reflected so you need not uh, do the changes manually you need to just select the right format for you and you can go for some other formats as well more complex formats like one we have in the format of like say date month year hours minutes seconds and milliseconds that might be a uh, good use if you are working like say in hospitals where you are recording the birth of kids and uh, you can record the exact birth up to milliseconds of specification and that's going to be useful for you. Learn to define the variable type dollar. Dollar you must be knowing is a currency, American currency. So it has been given a specific place in SPSS where you can define dollar currency but of course you can define other currency types that we will see in the coming lectures. So there are various formats for dollar currency listed right beginning from one dollar to like say dollar in decimals or like say millions. So depending upon the amount of figure maximum amount of figure that you want to enter in SPSS you can select an appropriate uh, dollar currency type for you. So we have selected a format and though already it was a date variable so that's why we are seeing this result. Now let's change it. Keep the date as date variable. Now let's take the income variable and turn it from scientific to dollar. Suppose we are measuring dollar uh, sorry income into dollars. So change it and now you can see a dollar symbol before the income variable. In this lecture we are going to learn about the custom currency option. Custom currency option is a valuable option for customizing the currencies in the local format. As you saw in the previous lecture that we can customize dollar currency, we can write the value directly into dollar currency in SPSS but other currency formats are not available. So for that SPSS gives you certain custom options. You can see they are listed as CCA, CCB, so currency A, currency B, currency C and so on and we can use them for the customization. On the right hand side you can see also the sample or preview of your currency. So let's try to define our currency and that is going to be the Indian rupee. Click OK. Let's take the income variable and go to the edit menu and click on options. You will see a currency tab there. Click on currency. And again you can see all those currencies CCA, CCB, CCC listed here. Why so many currencies? Because in a single data set you can work with the multiple currencies like say rupee, dollars and other types of currencies. So you can customize more than one currency here. Again on the right hand side you will see the preview of whatever currency you define. So let's select the currency CCA and customize it for the Indian rupee symbol. So you can type prefix and suffix for the currency. Prefix appears before your value. So type RS for Indian rupees. And also you can write the suffix like Indian rupees that will follow the value. But it's not recommended because it will create confusion. So either you can have a prefix or you can have a suffix. Again if you want to define negative values as well for your currency for example, if it is a bank account and the account can also take a negative value, the person like say draws money more as compared to like say deposit. So in that case, you can go for the negative value. Again, you have the decimal separators as period and comma listed here. Periods are generally more common in India and United States. But in European countries, you will see the comma separator is more common so you can select your separator and click OK. Again go to the currency and take the CC option. In fact that option has already been selected and you will see the rupee symbol prefixed. 
so you can see our income is now appearing in the format of rupee prefix and just to test you can type any other value and you will see again the rupee prefixed without any entry again you might wonder that rather than writing the rs dot you would like to write the actual indian rupee symbol that is r and cross over it so let's try to define it and see how to do that so the process is same but instead of writing the rs dot we are going to find out the rupee symbol and paste it here in the prefix so you can find the rupee symbol by searching on google and the way is that you can type the rupee symbol in ms word and copy and paste it from there into the spss box now if we copy the symbol in the spss we are expecting the rupee symbol as a prefix but uh, we will see a faint uh, square box because since it's a local symbol so it doesn't appear in the spss but this doesn't mean our symbol is not there it's there and in case you copy the output from spss to any other program for example say word program that has the availability of the symbol it will show you so you can see now you can see these boxes which are essentially the rupee symbol and if you copy them just for the sake of test into any other windows program like say notepad or ms word we'll see the rupee symbol as a prefix in this lecture we are going to learn about the string variables now string variables are the type of variables which are used when you want to record any qualitative data or qualitative variable for example say name of subject or roll number of subject let's take example of the current study in which we are studying the effect of hard work on performance suppose at the end of study you also want to record the feedback of subject which might come in the format of statements so for that you can define a string variable remember spss is not a software for doing qualitative data analysis but definitely you can store the qualitative data and later you can do some analysis by using other software so in our case let's define a new variable called name of subject and feedback so i'm creating feedback as first variable by default it's numeric let's convert it into a string variable because it's going to be in the format of statements then type the name again convert it into a string variable now the variables have been created let's enter a dummy feedback so suppose the first subject says i felt good after the experiment now since we have restricted the width to it so we need to increase it let's keep it more than 1000 so you can write a full story if you want about the feeling of your subject so i felt very good thanks name amit sharma again we have to increase the width so that we can accommodate the longer names if you don't increase the width then the text will be truncated in this lecture we are going to learn about the restricted numeric variable type now restricted numeric variable type is a variable type that is used when you are expecting only a positive value for some variable and then you don't expect to group the digits for example if you select a numeric variable type you can always group your digits for example for writing 1000 you can write 1 comma 000 but if for some reason if you don't like grouping of the digits you can go for the restricted numeric variable type if you read the information bar here it says the numeric type honors the digit grouping setting while the restricted numeric never uses the digit grouping so the message is clear that if you want to have non grouping or no grouping for the uh, numbers that you are using so in that case better you should go for the restricted numeric variable type in our case in our hard work versus performance study let's take an example where we also want to see the effect of age on the performance and we know that age is a variable that can take only a positive value it cannot be negative and the maximum is that we can have a subject for this study is 99 years 
so we are expecting maximum two digits you can expect three digits as well but that will take the number till 999 that is 999 and that is an unlikely age so maximum we are expecting two digits or say 100 years so let's define it and press ok so let's give this variable a name and call it age and it has been defined as a restricted numeric by default the width of variable is 8 but I said that for age variable the maximum digit I'm expecting is 2 so you can restrict it up to say just 2 variable now the variable has been created let's uh, define it and go to your data view now suppose the age of first subject is 23 years so you can write 23 but we did not see any like say leading zeros here if you want to see the leading zeros just increase the width and make it 3 so in that case uh, the maximum uh, digit we are expecting is up to 3 and the age of first subject is 23 so we are expecting one leading zero that is 0 0.23 as an entry so you can see once we increase the width we found the 0 0.23 if you increase the width more you will find more leading zeros for example the width is now 5 so we got a three leading zeros so that's very good option in case you are uh, giving the data entry task to someone else who is doing data entry for you and if you don't uh, want him to make any mistake or don't want to accommodate his mistake so what you can do you can define certain variables as a restricted numeric where you are expecting only a positive integer value up to certain digits only In this lecture we will learn the values option values are used to indicate the levels of a variable for example if you have a gender as a variable then gender has two levels that is male and female if you have income variable and you are taking people belonging to lower socioeconomic status, middle and upper socioeconomic status. So in that case you are having three levels of the income variable. Similarly in the case of liquor type of scales, you can have up to five levels, seven levels or multiple levels from strongly agree to strongly disagree. So let's learn how to define labels and values by using the value labels option. Now if we are having the metric variables or the scale variable that, that is hard work, intelligence and performance in our case which are perfectly continuous variables then we are not going to have labels for them. Again if we are measuring age in terms of number of years then again we are not going to have labels for them. But for gender yes because we are measuring people belonging to male and female category we can have two labels for the gender variable. So we are going to define two values, value 1 for the male and we are going to label it as male and value 2 for female and we are going to label it as female. If there is a third category you can add it and mark it others. If you want to change anything so you can click on that label and change the label. For example we can just write FEM for the female and change it but let's keep it as female and similarly we can do for the male and others variable as well you can do the spelling check as well now if you want to remove any variable you can also remove it now I have taken three liquor type of questions just to demonstrate how to use values options in SPSS and typically in the case of liquor type options these values are very important to define so I have taken three questions from the Oxford happiness questionnaire which is a questionnaire to measure happiness in general life and the responses has been scored from 1 to 6 whereas 1 is strongly disagree and 6 refers to strongly agree. So we are going to define these options by using the values options. So 1 for strongly disagree and similarly we are going to copy other variable descriptors and define them as a values and labels so third for so this is going to be typically useful when you are using with the demographic variables and the 
Likert scale type of variables like questionnaire variables. So we have finished copying our all the values from 1 to 6 and we have defined the question number 1 as a Likert measure. Now in large questionnaire based study you might have up to like say 100 or 200 questions like this so you need not type the responses every time you just copy and paste them and it works quickly. The missing values. Now missing values as you can see on this screen are those values which are missing from your data and you can see a dot for those values. So all those values for which we are having a dot here they are the missing values currently for the system. So in this data set currently we have values only for the income variables and rest of the values are counted as the missing values for hard work, intelligence, performance, age, gender as well as the Q1, Q2, Q3. Now let's try to define missing values. If you click on the missing value tab you will see a dialog box like this. The first entry says no missing values. So by default SPSS yes, consider there are no missing values in your data. The second option we have is the discrete missing values. So as its name suggests you can define up to three discrete missing values from your data. Let's take example of the age variable and suppose in the age variable for some reason you want all those persons who have reported their age as 18 years to be missing from the data. So you can define a discrete missing value for them and they will be excluded from the analysis. Please keep this in mind that here we are giving software a message that these values that is 18 years, 15 years or 13 years they are or they should not be counted during the calculation. So if you are calculating average or if you are testing a difference between group means these values will be excluded from the analysis though they will be present in your data set. That's very useful option so for some reason suppose you want to exclude all those persons who has exactly attained their age you can eliminate them from analysis. Apart from this you can also eliminate a range of values from your data while doing calculation. So for that you can select the third option that is the range plus one optional discrete missing value. For example let's uh, think that for some reason we want to exclude all those persons who are more than 50 years and up to 90 years. So we can define a range accordingly and also we are excluding the 18 years old from the analysis because they are the persons who have just attained the adulthood. So in this way we can define our missing values. This is another way of uh, doing missing value analysis that is why our missing value tab and we use this tab when doing the modeling studies for example in case of structural equation modeling. So what happens if we are having the large number of missing values so in that case we don't get the expected results so it's very important to do the missing value analysis for them. Now, Another important thing about missing value analysis is that sometimes we want to replace the missing values by some identif identifiable number. For example, we want to replace all these dots with some numbers so that the software knows during the analysis that they are the missing values. So in such cases we can make use of the transform option and go to the record into same variable or different variable. If you select the same variable so it's going to replace the existing variables with some missing values. The number that we define for ourselves. So I have created a first row in which we have the values while in the second row we don't have any value except for the income variable. So we have going to replace all those dots with some identifiable missing values. To define the system missing values go to the system missing and select the values. So in that case in this case we are going to replace all the dots with a minus 999 that is clearly identifiable value because we cannot expect a score of minus triple nine either for intelligence, hard work or performance or even the age variable. And once we click OK you can see the code has been executed 
we see all the values has been replaced by the minus triple nine which were absent from the data. Now this is important for software because now it knows that these are the system missing values and they should not be used for any sort of calculation in the analysis.